I'm here, Sid Redney, originally from Boston University and for a few years now uh, in Santa Fe Institute. And uh, many of you know already Sid, who came actually to some Dixon conference some uh, years ago. And uh, Sid is a major player in the StatFizz uh, community. And uh, today we'll talk about basketball. Even, even if you are not interested in basketball, I, I, I think it will be still interesting. So. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So very nice to be here again, see familiar faces, be in a familiar room. So the work I want to present to you today is um, based on, you know, this sort of style of just taking data wherever it is and trying to look at it through statistical physics eyes. And so we uh, looked at basketball scoring statistics. And uh, I have to say, in, when I give this talk in the United States, I, I ask for a show of hands at the beginning, how many people love basketball? So how many people love basketball? One. OK. <laughs> but you know, in the United States, everybody's hands goes up. And then, and then, I, and then, I, and then I ask, I like, what? My daughter loves OK. okay. <laughs> and then I ask, like, how many people hate basketball? I can't stand it. And, but nevertheless, the statistics of basketball scoring, I hope I'll convince you, are interesting because they're very simple and there's a lot of data and there's some very concrete uh, things you can uh, uh, get from the, the data itself. So this work is in collaboration with um, my former PhD student, Alan Gable, uh, my uh, collaborator at University of Colorado, Aaron Clausette, and his former student, Marina Kogan, and also supported by the John Templeton Foundation and the NSF. So um, anyways, if you look at basketball, um, this is what most people see. Um, you know, this is amazing. I mean, these guys are unbelievably well trained. They, you know, they jump like this. I, you know, I suffer a disease that maybe some of you have heard of. It's a very common disease in the United States. It's called white man's disease, which means you can't jump, you can't run. And so I can't do anything like what, look at that. I mean, that's just mind boggling. Uh, so anyways, you know, so this comes with skanky music and you see all these amazing feats of athleticism. Um, so this is what basketball might look like to the average American. You know, that's a pretty good one too, like, okay. Okay, but anyways, this is what I see. Uh, and so please excuse the lousy cinematography because this is me on shooting on my iPhone. Um, <laughs> But what I see is over and over again is a random walk being uh, played over and over again, just flipping a coin. So what I'm going to try and convince you in this talk is that basketball scoring is almost the same as just watching a, ran a coin flipping. So for those of you who hate basketball, there's a good reason to my taste, which is that it's the same as doing this. And for those of you who love basketball, well, maybe you'll hate me at the end of the talk. Okay. So um, just to give you a sense of like what we have done is that we were able to like um, download or steal, depending on your perspective, all uh, scoring statistics or all scoring events in over 10 seasons of NBA basketball game data. So basically what we have is something that looks like this for each game. At each instant of time where a scoring event occurs, we record like at 12 seconds of the game, a basket was scored, and the score went from 0, 0 to 2, 0, and then maybe went to 3, 2. And we just follow this, and so we have this for like, you know, of the order of 10 seasons of basketball. So this is a typical time trace. I just picked one game uh, at random, Chicago playing Denver. And so the basic metric is the score difference. So the score starts out 0, 0. And in this particular game, Denver raced out to his huge lead. It scored the first, like, you know, 10 points of the game, and then there was some fluctuation because Chicago scored a few points. But for almost all of the game, Denver had this huge lead, and then there was this incredible comeback near the end of the game where Chicago had the lead, and then there's some funny stuff happening at the end. But the basic question we want to ask is that this trace, which, you know, if you didn't look at it very critically, you'd say, well, this looks kind of like a random walk. And we want to ask statistically, is this actually a random walk process? So that's the goal of the talk. All right. So, um, you know, again, having all the data, let's now just apply some very simple analysis uh, to, to it. And so uh, the one question we might look at, or the very first thing we look at, is the scoring rate. That is, what is the probability that a score occurs at a given point in the game? So in basketball, the game lasts 48 minutes, which is 2,880 seconds. And what I'm plotting here is that each second of the game, 
What is the probability a scoring event happened at 300 seconds in the game? And the main take home message you should take from this plot is that, well, there's some fluctuations. And please ignore these huge lines at the end. That's just sort of an artifact of how the data was presented. But the main point is that, roughly speaking, the scoring rate is constant. That's, you know, basic message number one. That's an average of all games, all games of the same season? Yes. Okay. Yes. So roughly speaking, more or less average scoring rate. And you see that the average scoring rate corresponds, there's a number here of roughly 0.03 which corresponds to roughly one score every 30 seconds. And in NBA basketball, there is this rule that if you don't shoot the ball towards a basket and it hits the backboard within 24 seconds, you lose possession of the basketball. So there is an incentive to not just hold the basketball and not do anything. You have to try and advance it downfield and or down the court and uh, try and make a shot. So that sort of sets a natural scale for the rate at which scoring uh, occurs. Um, another thing which is actually a little bit more subtle is looking at the uh, time intervals between scores. So, um, you know, again, in basketball, uh, once a team scores, the other team gets the ball and you then take it up court and you try and score and you, should have, you have to at least attempt to score within 30, 24 seconds. And, but what one can then look is what is the probability that there is a time delay of delta T between successive scores? And so when you plot this data very nicely, it looks very exponential. This is a semi-log plot of the log logarithm of the probability of a scoring event after a time delay delta t um, after the previous scoring event. And so the, uh, the statement that comes from here is that it looks like this is an exponential distribution. So this is, seems to be described by a Poisson process. And one more thing to just say is that it doesn't, mat <coughs> it doesn't matter if I look at either team scoring or just look at a single team and look at the time delay between single team scores, these two distributions look more or less the same, except this one is increased by a time scale of a factor of two, because each team scores at half the rate of, the, of both teams scoring on average. So these two taken together seem to suggest that the probability of a time delay delta t between scores is just given by an exponential distribution which would seem to suggest that well maybe a Poisson process is actually governing the uh, scoring events in basketball. Um, another thing which is actually maybe even more subtle and is actually I would say very important is this notion of hot hand. And so um, at least again I, I assume that uh, you, you see sports enough that this notion that like a team is hot or a team is cold or a player is hot, you, you've heard of this terminology. And so the question is, does a hot hand, pardon me? <laughs> Can you all remind, okay, so le let me remind. So in, uh, in this particular study that was done in, in 85, they were trying to test whether or not um, basketball players had a hot hand. And so the notion of a hot hand is that if I'm really hot, give me the basketball because like I'm really, I've got, I've got a groove going on and so every time I'm gonna sh make a shot, every time I'm gonna make, um, every time I attempt a shot, I'm gonna make it. So the idea of a hot hand is that you are somehow, you're correlated with yourself and that, you know, if you're a 50% shooter, but somehow you feel like I'm gonna make every single shot. Uh, and so the question was, does this effect actually exist? If I take a particular basketball player and I look at their shots over the season and suppose a basketball player is a 60% shooter. Is the statistics of making and missing shots governed, uh, d is the actual data uh, consistent with a random event which has a probability of success 60% or is it consistent with some kind of correlations going on? And so that is the basic question we wanted to investigate with the data. Well, you know, this is a, one of those things that um, if you look at data, I would say that the data shows that the probability that the, the hot hand, if it exists at all, is an in incredibly tiny effect. But if you ask sportscasters, people who play basketball, they say, oh, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. So, <laughs> and in fact, there's a very great quote in this paper. This is a really wonderful paper. I highly recommend reading it because what they say at the end of their paper is it says, common experience shows that common experience is a very bad indicator of statistical <laughs> patterns. <laughs> Anyway, so let's look at the correlations between successive scores. So let's suppose that there's an average scoring rate, so there's an average scoring time, so uh, the scores on average should be a certain time delta, you know, t average apart. 
And so if there is streakiness going on, if a team is, for example, very hot, then the score should happen very frequently. Or if the team is very cold, then the, the score should happen very far apart. And so the deviation of um, the kth score from the average value should be large when there's a streak. It should either be very negative or very positive. And that the, this deviation, if, I, if a team is hot, then two deviations will, if they're very small, that means that they'll be strongly correlated. Or if a team is cold, they'll also be very strongly correlated. So the natural thing to look at is this correlation between different scoring events. And so um, let's look at this correlation function, which is the, you know, the deviation of the k score and the k plus n score. And if there was some correlation, you'd expect, well, this correlation function should, though it's been normalized so that at n equals 0, it's equal to 1. And then as a function of n, it should decay with n. And how it decays with n should tell us something about correlations between successive scores in basketball. Unfortunately, the data shows nothing in the sense that once you get to n equals 1, uh, the data for both either team scoring or um, one team scoring, there's basically this correlation at the level of 10 to the minus 2. And that's it. There's no, there's no spatial pattern, no nothing. So this seems to be a useful piece of evidence that seems to suggest that basketball scoring is described by a Poisson process with no correlations between scoring events. And so this is the first piece of evidence to try and suggest that, well, maybe basketball scoring is nothing more than watching a coin flip. Um, another thing which is perhaps even more basic and is if I look at, you know, I start with the score 0, 0, then the score difference is gradually growing as a function of time, and that's what I'm plotting here. Um, so sigma squared is the score difference squared as a function of time. And so you see that it's growing very nicely with linear for the moment Please ignore this last part here. I will come back to it later on. But at least for the first 45 minutes of the game or so, the, the data seems like it's re reasonably consistent with linear behavior, which is, again, another piece of evidence that suggests that this is random walk-like. Um, so anyways, uh, these are like very coarse measures. And so at least I hope I've given you a sense that maybe to think about uh, ran scoring in a basketball game as a random walk is not crazy. Um, but it turns out that, you know, again, I'm not a sports fan, so I can't, I, I don't know what it's like to watch a basketball game because I can't stand watching it. But um, my impression is that, you know, if a game is a blowout, you, you, don't, you don't watch it because, you know, if one team is winning by 40 points, like what's the point of watching it because you know who's going to win. So the interesting part of a game is when the lead changes. That's like the exciting part of the game. And so it turns out that we can actually get a lot of, interesting information by looking at statistics of lead changes and also this provides more evidence for like the random walk picture of basketball scoring. So um, here are some basic questions you might want to ask if you are uh, someone interested both in the statistics of basketball scoring or just if you're a sports fan. How many lead changes occur? How long is one team in the lead? You know all these very simple questions and so I'd like to answer some of these questions in the, in the rest of this presentation. <coughs> So um, first of all, number of lead changes. So here is this, a, a schematic plot as a function of time with the score difference, some kind of a random walk-like process. And so lead change occurs when the lead change occurs. So we want to account the number of these points. How many of these points are there? So let me give you, um, uh, tell you what the answer is. If you had evenly matched teams and there was n scoring events in a basketball game, and by the way, I should tell you that roughly speaking, in a typical basketball game, like the score is 100 to 100, each score is roughly worth two points. And so that means that there's roughly 100 scoring events in a basketball game. And so if n is 100, and uh, if we just believe a random walk-like picture that, um, like this, then um, you would expect roughly 10 scoring, uh, 10 lead changes. So first of all, why is this? Well, uh, maybe I'm belaboring the obvious in a place like this, but here is the probability distribution of a random walk. So at x equals 0, it's 1 over root n, and we want to sum up the times that you're at the origin up to time n, and so you get root n. And so uh, you get roughly 10 lead changes if there's really 100 scoring events in a, in a basketball game, and it was described by a random walk. However, there's now, I'm going to mention now some buts, and the first important but is notion of anti-persistence. In fact, when basketball was first invented, it was an unbelievably boring game because you'd score a basket, 
And then they'd stop the play. They'd bring the ball back to midcourt. They'd throw it up in the air to have a tip off. It's the same as soccer or what you call football here, right? So you'd start the ball right in the center again. So like there was like a renewal process. The game started all over from the beginning. And in basketball, it's such a fast-paced game, there's ruined the game. And so what you have happen is that if I scored at the basket at the far end, then the other team gets possession of the basketball. Game, of the basketball. And it turns out that if you average over all um, basketball uh, events, uh, you find that it's not, it's not really a random walk, but what we might call an anti-persistent random walk. That is that if I score, then the probability that I will score next is roughly one-third, whereas the probability the other team scores next is two-thirds because they have possession of the basketball. So we should think of it as a random walk in which if I do a step to this direction, then not with probability half I go left or right, but with probability two-thirds I go come back in the same direction. So, but that's easy to account for in the framework of random walk theory. And so it turns out um, that if you have evenly matched teams, but there's this anti-persistence parameter P, that the effective number of returns to the origin, instead of it being square root of n, is modified by this. And this is basically something you can calculate easily and just by you can uh, calculate what is the effective diffusion coefficient. And it's reduced because if I make a step here, then I'm drawn back towards the origin. And if you ask, like, what is the mean displacement after two steps? And then say that's equal to root square root of 2 dt, you find immediately uh, this factor, correction factor, 1 minus p over p, which is roughly for these numbers a factor of 2. So the number of um, lead changes uh, should be roughly you know, 1.5 times square root of n instead of just square root of n. And so now let's, um, uh, oh, and it, in fact, one can even do more than that. One can look at the distribution of the number of lead changes. So in the case of no anti-persistence, uh, this is a beautiful work by George Weiss in 94. He found the distribution of the number of lead changes. And it's just given by a Gaussian. And if you just take his result and plug in the effective new diffusion coefficient, you get a Gaussian distribution with a renormalized diffusion coefficient. And let's see how this naive thing works against actual data. And so here is um, the data. Um, I'm showing actually three things. One is the actual NBA game data over these 10 seasons. So it looks Gaussian-ish. Um, the black line is just this Gaussian with no, uh, the only fitting parameter is the anti-persistence parameter, which we know from, um, from the data. And you see that it matches pretty well. And in fact, one can get a better match by instead of doing a pure Gaussian process, just assume basketball is described by a Poisson process of scoring events, include the anti-persistence uh, as well, and you see that it matches the data you know, really, really well. So these very simple random walk-like pictures seem to account for some very non-trivial aspects of basketball. Now let me turn to something even more subtle and one that uh, I think actually surprises most people when they first encounter it, which is you can ask, how long is one team in the lead? And what is the distribution of the time that one team is leading? So in this particular example, again, Chicago versus Denver. So Denver has this huge lead. It's leading almost the entire game. Then Chicago is, has a comeback, and it's leading for a short time. Then Denver's leading. And you see that finally Denver won this game by one point. And so if we look at um, the times that Denver is leading, so there is this long green period where Denver's leading to here, then Chicago leads, then Denver leads, and finally Denver's leading at the very end of the game. And what I'm asking for now is the length of this stick compared to the entire length of the game itself. What is the probability distribution of the length of this stick? That's the basic question. So naively, you'd say, well, if the teams are evenly matched, then the length of the stick should have average length one half of the total game. And the distribution of the length should be at least symmetrical about one half. That would be the most naive thing. So here is now this probability that the team is leading a fraction f of the game. And so you might think, well, it's a symmetric distribution. Is it that? Some, OK, well, you, you, know more, you know more. You're smart. Um, so anyways, um, here's the data. There's that. And what's amazing about this is that now we have a zero parameter fit because this is just the actual data. And um, here is the arc sine law. So in fact, this distribution of the number of fraction of times that you're leading is just perfectly matches the arc sine law. And it's a zero parameter fit because all you need is just the length of the, of the game. And so it, it matches it just incredibly well. 
So, you know, it's a funny thing because, you know, I've been working all my life in random walk theory. And I know that after about 10 years of working in the field, I thought, well, you know, I've worked in 10 years. Maybe I know something. And the first time I encountered the arc sine law, I realized I knew nothing. And, um, you know, there's so many beautiful mysteries just in the good old one-dimensional random walk. And the arc sine law is just one example of it. Can I give what? Okay. What? Yeah. So um, I well, I, I don't know what to. S I mean, so the, first of all, this is the arc sine law. But like, how do you derive it? It's actually um, actually, if you if you allow me to go ahead a few slides, I'm going to derive it. So it turns out there's three arc sine laws. Arc sine law one, two, three, and it turns out that one can derive arc sine law two by complete, completely elementary methods. So if you allow me, let me do that, and hope. And if you still have the question, ask it after that. So here's a, um, another amusing example, which is when does the last lead change occur in a game? So here in this particular game, the last lead change occurs at time t. And you might ask, what is the probability distribution of this time? And again, uh, when I first thought about this, um, well, I thought, well, the teams are evenly matched. They trade leads very often. So the last lead change should occur somewhere close to the end of the game. So I should have a distribution with a peak somewhere close to the very end of the game. That's what I, I thought. So let's see if that's going to be correct. So I'm going to derive this uh, probability distribution of the last lead change. And the way you can derive it in, in an elementary way is the following. If I really think that um, this is a random walk motion, well, if the last lead change occurs at time t, that means that the random walk which started at the origin has to be at the origin at time t. So I must have a return at time t. But then if this is the last lead change, it must mean that this trajectory can never cross the origin again. And so well, the way you can think about this is I, I have a final score difference x, which I don't know yet. And my trajectory, if we go backwards in time, cannot hit the origin. So it must be exactly a first passage path. It must first come back to this point exactly at this time. So in a time capital T minus little t, I go from x to the origin for the very first time. And this quantity, um, so I call it a time-reversed first passage path. And so this part we know from just random walk theory. It's just the probability of being at the origin. Uh, this one might be a little bit less familiar. This is the first passage probability. Um, and let me show you how to get that if you don't know how to get this. Um, and so uh, this is sort of an elementary primer on the first passage probability in one dimension. So um, where is a random walk that's given by the occupation probability? So, uh, and I, I see here, I could have an inconsistency notation. I might have used P for probability, and now I'm using C for concentration, but they mean the same thing. Um, so I, well, now I want to ask a different question, which is, and now that I know where a random walk is, I want to ask, when does a random walk, if it starts at some arbitrary position, x naught, when does it first hit the origin? And it turns out there's a really simple way of deriving this thing by using the image method from electrostatics. So here is my random walk that starts at x naught. And it's hitting the origin at some time t. But in order to impose the fact that if, it's a, if it hits the origin, it's absorbed at the origin, I have to impose an absorbing boundary condition, which means the concentration has to be 0. And that can be imposed easily by putting an anti-Gaussian starting at minus x naught and letting it propagate forward in time. And by, by construction, if, the, if a random walk trajectory reaches a time t, the anti-random walk trajectory also reaches a time t. And so the total concentration uh, in the positive x-axis is just the sum of a Gaussian and an anti-Gaussian. So that's the concentration field. And then what I want to compute is what is the probability of falling off the cliff or hitting the origin. So I have to compute the flux at the origin. So that's this object. And that's what's called the first passage probability. And when you do that, you end up with this. And the two points that are worth emphasizing about this for those who don't work in statistical mechanics which are truly mind-boggling when you think about it, is that if I integrate this first passage probability over all time, it's 1. I am sure to fall off the cliff. I am sure to reach the origin. But if I compute the average time to reach the origin, it's infinite, because the first passage probability has a power law tail. So this dichotomy be between being sure to reach the origin and taking an infinite amount of time to do so is what makes random walks so enigmatic and so beautiful. So anyways, now returning to our story, we've now derived the first passage probability. 
And so what I need to do then to compute the probability of t return time at t is I just have to integrate over all possible final positions because I don't know what it is. And so here is this probability of that last lead change occurs at time t. So I'm integrating um, over all x the first passage probability with the return probability. And the factor 2 comes because the final position could be Chicago is winning or Denver is winning. So I have to add those two up. And this turns out to be um, an elementary integral and you end up with an arc sine law. So it's kind of cool. And that's called the second arc sine law. And there's also arc sine law 3 and it turns out mathematically it's the same as arc sine 2 but it's asking a very different question. When is the probability distribution of times of the largest lead in the game? And amazingly enough they're all the same. So anyways, let me show you, like, again, uh, comparing NBA data with uh, theory. So here is the actual data. And so it looks very arc sine law-ish, so hopefully you're not so surprised about it. Also notice there's a little bit of like funny business at the end of the first quarter, the first half, the third quarter. Um, so here is the result of simulations uh, with an homogeneous Poisson process. Namely, I assume an average scoring rate of 0 0.032 per the game, and I just play lots of games of basketball, I compute the time of the last lead change in this distribution, I get that. Um, however, one can do a lot better by taking inhomogeneous Poisson process because I said at the beginning that the average rate of scoring was constant. It's not constant, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But if I take the instantaneous scoring rate at every single point in the game, then I can actually replicate these weird glitches that happen here. And finally, here's the arc sine law. So it's, this is a very sort of satisfying plot because the simple theory, the simple model works very well. The more sophisticated model gives rise to, you know, you account for the glitches and then you have the zero parameter fit. So it all seems very um, appealing. So the glitches are beyond my participants? No, the glitches are because of the scoring rate not being constant at the end of the first quarter, the first half, third quarter, and the end of the game. I'm going to come to that point okay. momentarily. So uh, one last thing I want to mention about this particular aspect, which is why are there two peaks? I mean, now we see that the data says there are two peaks, but can we understand that in some kind of simple-minded way? And here's my simple-minded way of trying to, uh, to show it, which is let's plot the score difference again, but instead of plotting it versus time, let's plot it versus log time. Because a random walk is a scale invariant process, and the time between returns to the origin are growing like root t, then on this logarithmic scale, these times for returns are roughly like the same order of magnitude. And so if the game ends over here, one sees that in this particular picture, the la last che lead change occurred very close to the end of the game. So that seems very simple. But now here's another trace. And the point here is that, well, the last lead change is now over here. But on a logarithmic time scale, this is like way, way back in the past, very close to the beginning of the game. And so if you start looking at this critically, you realize that to make the last lead change happen halfway in the game, you have to like arrange this last thing to be like just in one spot. So it's a very unlikely thing to occur. And so that's, you know, at least my hand-waving way why there are two peaks. Um, last sort of very simple-minded um, application is when is a lead safe? So I guess in England, this actually resonated a lot better because there there's game time betting you know you can go to the bookie right now and there's a game play being pl played right now and you can say you know my team is ahead by 10 points I want to put a hundred dollars down that they're going to win the game and so the question is when is a lead actually safe and so let me call QLT the probability of a, that a lead is safe when a time T or tau remains in the game so here's my lead of size L here, time tau, and I want to ask, when is I'm sure that this lead is safe? And so, um, well, the lead is safe if you don't cross the origin. And so it's just the integral, the f so the lead is unsafe for the probability 1 minus the probability the lead is safe. And 1 minus this, this quantity is just the probability that you hit the origin before time t. So this is probably the lead is actually not safe. 1 minus it is the probability the lead is safe. But because we've now I demonstrated that so much of this process it seems to be described by a pure random walk, I'll just use the good old random walk theory for the first passage probability. And so it's just a simple error function. There's nothing more to it. And we also see from this that the natural scale, the natural unscaled variable is not the, it's, it's the ratio of the lead to the uh, 
square root of the time. So this is the natural scaled measure of how big a lead is. And to give you a sense of what, these number, uh, what this functional form means, let's just plug in some numbers. And so it turns out that if you have a 10 point lead in a basketball game with eight minutes to go, then your lead is 90% safe. So that gives you a sense like how, how what safe means. Anyways, um, here is um, the NBA basketball data. Here is our theory with no adjustable parameters. And so it looks pretty good. In the United States, there's a guy named Bill James, this guy here. And so I don't want to trash him here because nobody knows who he is. Does anyone know who he is? OK, so let me, not, let me not go into it. But anyways, he's just a guru of doing quantitative analysis. And that, this is his way, his measure. And so it didn't work very well. OK, so is basketball scoring just a random walk? I hope I presented data to you that says it seems plausible. But now let's, let me now go in the remaining time just to, <coughs> yeah, yeah. I think they do it more empirically. I mean, I have to say I don't know, uh, but you know, I, in hidden in my in two of my papers on this, I mean, there are algorithms that if I was like a pr completely mercenary person, all I cared about was money, I would go to the bookies right now, and you know, I'd look at the odds they give me, I'd use my calculation, and I'd, I'd make a million dollars. But right. so I you're, tried. I haven't tried. No, I, it's not. It's not worth my time. I mean, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather work on random walks. <laughs> <laughs> but usually, the, the usual example of what makes the race essentially is maybe the new statistics, but it's also who is betting. I mean, yeah. It, it stays to one if 10 persons bet on one and, and yeah. only one on the other. Yeah, well, look, I, 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 I've never really bet in my life, so I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about there, but. Yeah. Why, 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 it, why it could be a random walk? I mean, the yeah, I, I, will, I, I, will, I will give you my philosophy why I think it's a random walk at the very end. But yes, I, I think there's a very simple reason why it's a random walk like. OK, so anyways, I, th I presented you a story that maybe suggests that you know, basketball scoring is described by a random walk. But there's some buts. And so I want to now go through some of the buts because I hope they actually make this case even more strongly. So one but is anti-persistence. Um, we've seen that uh, when team A scores, then the same team scores next probability roughly one third. But you know we've taken it into account this into account, and it, it seems that we still can describe things by random walk. There's one more. Th well, there's actually three more things, but here's the next one, which is it turns out that in basketball, the last two and a half minutes of a basketball game are completely different than the first 45 and a half minutes. And again, when I give this talk in the United States, everybody nods in agreement because. You know, the first 45 minutes, they take maybe an hour and a half of, the, of, of TV time. But the last two and a half minutes, there's a million timeouts. There's all kinds of breaks and commercials and whatever. But, and it takes forever. And it's, a, it's a, just a different character game. And let me show you how it's different. So first of all, I come back to my original plot where I said, well, you know, this is roughly a constant scoring rate across a game. But notice here then the last two and a half minutes of the game, there's this huge increase in the scoring rate. In fact, there's increases in the scoring rate at the end of the third quarter, the first half, the first quarter. But the sc average scoring rate in the last two and a half minutes of the game is a factor two higher. Even though the game slows down in real time, like it's sort of it's, you know, violating relativity. The game is slowing down, but the scoring rate is going up. Uh, and so what is the effect of this increased scoring rate? And so again, we saw the score difference uh, you know, the, the variance in the score difference was more or less growing linearly with time, but it's going down here. So something weird is happening here. And so and to look at this a little bit more starkly, let's look at the actual distribution of the score difference at different times in the game. And so what I'm plotting here is the probability of a score difference. Delta is the score difference. And again, it's better not to plot it versus the raw score difference, but properly scaled by the square root of the time in the game and by the effective diffusion coefficient based on what we actually get from the empirical data. And so here is the score difference at the end of the first quarter of the game. It looks Gaussian-ish. I'll do this at the end of the first half. Uh, 
it still looks kind of Gaussian. And because everything has been properly scaled, the data falls in the same plot. So the, the, the way that, no, no, no. We, we're taking the, diffu the diffusion coefficient is done by looking at the total number of scoring events in a game and the, the average value of a scoring event, which is roughly two, but it's not exactly two because sometimes, it's, yeah, yeah, so yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, but it's fit intrinsically from the data itself. And so you see very nice data collapse, which makes us feel like we know what we're doing. And this is what the score difference looks like at the end of the third quarter. It looks very scaling-like. At the end of 45 and a half minutes, it's almost the same. It looks like maybe there's a little bit more peakishness at, at, at the top. But then this is what happens in the last two and a half minutes. So completely bizarre. It's like the last two and a half minutes are everything in the game. And typically what teams are doing is they're playing for a tie. You know, that last second shot, some miracle shot that they play for a tie. And in fact, it makes this huge effect. So the last two and a half minutes are completely different than the last, the first 45 and a half minutes. So what I tell people, you know, like spouses of people who are bored with their spouses being basketball fiends, say, well, if you have to force to be watch a basketball game, just watch the last two and a half minutes. Um, there's also a bias. Everything that I've discussed so far, um, and this comes back to the question about the random walk nature uh, of basketball scoring, um, I've assumed that the teams were evenly matched. That's not true. You know, the Cleveland Cavaliers are better than, well, I, I, don't, I don't know who the last place team is, but you know, there's good teams and there's lousy teams. Teams are not evenly matched. They're typically unevenly matched. But what I want to try and argue for you is that they're not that unevenly matched. Because think about the NBA basketball. You know, I went to grade school. I could not sink a basketball if my life depended on it. But the best kids in my elementary school, they went to then the best high schools, they then went to the best colleges, they then got drafted by the NBA, they're then perfectly trained, perfectly coached. So the people at the pinnacle of the field, they're all fantastic. So even the worst player on the worst NBA team is a million times better than me. And the dispersion between the worst player on the worst NBA basketball team and the best player is not that much. And because of this multiple levels of filtration, the NBA basketball is actually rather you know, competitive. And so the point is that they're not unevenly matched. And as I'm going to argue, their differences don't matter. So let's look at the role of unevenly matched teams. So we saw that the distribution of the time for the last lead change in a basketball game was given by this arc sign law when the teams were equal strength. You can do the same calculation if instead of a, rand, a pure or unbiased diffusion, you have a slight bias. It's a little bit more complicated calculation, but it's possible to do it. And um, so here we have the a velocity, which is the bias velocity in, in a biased random walk. And that will be my measure of how unequal the teams are matched. And so if you now look at this um, distribution as a function of uh, you know, the, the time, again, it's a U-shaped curve. And it turns out that one can then also look at all the NB basketball data and get a measure for what is the bias velocity. And it turns out that the actual number is roughly 0 0.004. So you see that there's a slight um, you know, asymmetry in, in this plot. But what we really need to do if we want to like, do this over all basketball teams is we have to average this asymmetry over all possible uh, velocities that exist in the actual data. And when you do that averaging, one finds it becomes symmetrical again. And um, here, for reasons that I don't remember anymore, we also looked at when there was different anti-persistence parameters. But when we average over all the asymmetry, we just get back a symmetric distribution that you can't distinguish um, from the data itself. So that's the role of bias. Another feature, which is probably uh, you, know, you wouldn't be so surprised about, is there is a there is a systematic effect that if whoops sorry um, whoops I'll get it right yeah okay so um, as a function of the lead size if I look at the scoring probability if I'm ahead by 40 points my starters are sitting on the bench they're joking they're having a grand old time and so their scoring rate is only around 0.4 scoring probability whereas if the team is 40 points behind. They're like desperate. They're throwing up lots of three-point shots. They're making fouls. They're doing everything possible to try and catch up. And there's a systematic effect 
uh, that the scoring rate is systematically decreasing the more you're in the lead. So that seems to make sense. You get lazy when you're in the lead. So what I want to do now in my last you know, few minutes is that I want to now actually develop a really detailed computational model of basketball that, that accounts for all these buts and let's just see what comes out of this. And so this last model is based on something called the Bradley-Terry model of competition. And the basic input variable is you have like a league, say, and each team is given a strength, X alpha. And so when two teams play, one has a strength X alpha, another team a strength X beta, we have um, a probability that uh, team alpha is going to win when two teams uh, meet. And so in the Bradley-Terry model, this is it. So if I have a team of strength XA playing a team of strength XB, the probability that A wins is just the ratio of, the, you know, it's the, it's the strength of the team A divided by the sum of the, of the strengths. So the absolute strength no longer matters here. It's only in something involves relative strength. So this is the Bradley-Terry model of competition, and it's, it's a very beautiful model, and one can use it for all kinds of things about how to get ahead in basketball or get ahead in life or, you know, win grants, whatever. Um, you can use this kind of methodology. But we want to now include what we know from basketball, and there's two things we know. One is anti-persistence. So if I score, that means that my probability of scoring again has to be decreased by this one-third factor, and so that's what I have to include here. So this plus or minus sign means that, or the minus or plus sign means that if A scores, then I decrease my scoring probability by 0.152, whereas P the probability of B uh, scoring goes up by 0.152. And then, you know, at a next level, we also have this score difference bias, that if the score difference is positive, my scoring rate goes down. If, my score, if, my, uh, if I'm losing, then my, score, um, my scoring rate goes up, and so there's this additional factor. So what we did then is we um, played millions of seasons of basketball, because we can do it on a computer, no problem. We, we, have, we made, like... Uh, you know, a league of 30 teams, the only input parameter is the strength of each team. And then we said, well, we have the strength distribution of each team, what should we choose? Well, Gaussian seems like a reasonable thing. And the only parameter left then is the width of the distribution of these team strengths. So we take our, you know, we make our league of 30 teams, we have a strength distribution, we have some width, we then play millions of seasons of basketball, we compute things like you know, what's the win what is the winning fraction of the, top of the team as a function of its rank? Uh, what's the time it spends in the lead over average overall games? What's the t probability distribution of the last lead change? We can measure jillions of statistical measures. And when we do that, oh, so here again is the probability of the, of the team strength. So since the absolute value doesn't matter, we take a mean value, and the only parameter in a model is this variance of strengths. So we look at all these different bizarre measures, the time leading in a game, the number of lead changes in game, the winning fraction of a game versus your rank. So say, what I mean by this is that, you know, at the end of the season, you know, maybe uh, Toronto Raptors were the first place team in the NBA East. And so they had a winning fraction of 0.74. And the next team was the Boston Celtics and their winning fraction is maybe 0.7. So winning fraction, winning percentage as a function of rank, that's what I mean there. And so what we do is that we measure all these different quantities at different widths of the distribution. And we ask, when does our data match best NBA data by varying the width of the distribution? And so this is showing the deviation of our data from NBA basketball data that we have um, as a function of this one parameter model, the strength of the distribution. And you see that all these arcane measures seem to have a common minimum at the same point. So this, we argue, is like, empirically determine the, the right value of the width of the team strengths. And so with this width of team strengths, we can then replicate with great fidelity all these bizarre measures of, of basketball scoring. And so we would say that we have now found a random walk model for basketball scoring data. Now, one other thing about this global optimum and this width being at 0.0083, that means that since we took a Gaussian distribution, that meant that two-thirds of all team strengths are within one plus or minus the square root of this, op of this variance. So one point plus or minus 0 0.09. So the strongest team in normalized units is 1.09, and the weakest team is 0.91. And again, what we would say here is that there's been so many levels of filtration. You start with like 
little kids on the basketball court. And by the time you get to the NBA, everybody is a six foot eight behemoth. They're perfectly trained. They're well coached. They have dietitians. They on the off season, they're, they're working out. They're not futzing around anymore. So the point is that, you know, in the early days of basketball, you could have like one team like the Boston Celtics winning nine championships in a row. That ain't going to happen anymore because if some team has any kind of an advantage, there are people watching and looking at signals like, oh, that guy, he like ate like, you know, it's three ounces of quinoa this morning and he can jump like a fraction of an inch higher. We should have all our basketball players eating quinoa for breakfast or something like that. So as soon as like anybody figures out any kind of a competitive advantage, it's immediately arbitraged away. And all that's left once you have perfectly trained, perfectly coached, you know, unbelievable athletes, all that's left behind is random fluctuations. So that is philosophically why I would argue that basketball scoring is described by a random walk. So um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, one last thing I have to say though is that because now I come from New Mexico, and again, in the United States, this is more in people's consciousness. But in, in New Mexico, there is this thing called Area 52. Do people know about this? You know, where the UFO landed and the, uh, you know, the, um, you know the, the body of the alien is like, you know, it's displayed. In oh, 51? Okay, anyways, the point is that, so if you go to Roswell, New Mexico, and I highly recommend it for, for entertainment value, in an old dead theater is the UFO Museum. And they always have the same thing because they present all these bizarre things like pictures of the flying saucer and a picture of the alien. And they say, we present the facts. You decide. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. No, I have no idea what to say there. You said there were many more uh, breaks you had. Yes. So, the, so could it mean that just the, the players are more uh, you know, uh, rested? Rest they become more effective again. Well, except for the, I mean, I, I have the other thing though is that typically, like um, basketball is much more free flowing through the first 45 minutes of the game. You know, they're just running up and down the court. There's relatively few timeouts. But all the timeouts, they're always having a specific play. They're always doing something very well programmed. So I think that also plays as much a role as freshness. Yes? Oh, yeah, there, there, is, there, is, there is some limit. But because I don't watch basketball, I don't know what it is. But you know, it's, not, it's like some number that's not unreasonable, like it might be 10 timeouts in a game or seven timeouts. I don't know what it is, but. Well, it also depends on whether the score is close. Like if a game is a blowout, then the game is a blowout. But if it's a close game, and if also if it's especially in the uh, playoffs, and if it's like game seven of the deciding game, I, I mean, I can remember in the 1980s watching the Boston Celtics play the LA Lakers. And you know, the last two minutes of the game would take like 45 minutes on the TV because every single time out and you know they, they wash the floor they have the cheerleaders come out they have commercial breaks it just goes on and on forever yes Well, well, I mean, I guess the, the one nice feature about basketball is that there's lots of data. Uh, I mean, so, you know, we act, and lots of scoring, exactly. So, you know, we actually try to apply the same analysis to like major sports in the United States. So there's soccer, there's football, there's hockey. And what I would say about hockey, because that's a sport I know since I'm Canadian and, you know, the world's best players are all from Canada. Um, so in hockey, it, it actually it seems like the data seems very consistent with the same thing with basketball data. There's only one slight problem, which is like it's same as like with soccer. There's n essentially no data. So if you're willing to wait about a million years, and I'll get a million years of data, I hope I could present to you in a million years from now like a picture that shows that hockey scoring also has the same statistical patterns. What about like football? Well, American football also doesn't have that much scoring. You know, like that's the score might say 45 to be 45 to seven, but what it really means is 
six major scores and one minor score versus one minor score. So it's actually not very much scoring. Basketball seems to be really the ideal sport because it's free flowing and there's right, roughly 100 events in a game. No, I mean, again, I, I, I go back to my original statement, which is that, you know, you have two people who are incredibly well-trained, well-coached, uh, well, you know, well-nourished, well-slept, well whatever. I mean, they're, they're optimized, they're tr and they're trying to do the same thing. And so the only thing that decides, like, who's going to actually score the basket is some random fluctuation. That's, that's what I would argue. There was, yeah. Yep. Whether this is constant in time, so year by year, I mean, or oh, oh, okay. Well, no, that that's actually a really good point. And what I would first of all, we only have ten years of data, so we can't really see systematic changes in the strength over over long periods of time. But in fact, yes, I would say that um, we actually have data from baseball where we can look at like 120 years of data, and what we can see there is that the variance in team strengths has been systematically decreasing over a 120 year period because you know, 100 years ago in the off season, what, the, what baseball players did, they went home and smoked cigars and drank beers and got out of shape and went to training camp to get back into shape. Now they're training all year round. And so the point is that back in the good old days, you know, someone who had a really great advantage like Babe Ruth, you know, people didn't know how to deal with him. But now, you know, you have lots of, everything is optimized. It's like the evolutionary rat race. You know, you're trying to get ahead of somebody and as more and more people start watching what people are doing to get ahead, then everyone's running faster and faster to stay in place. So at least in baseball, we see a, over a 100-year period, a very s clear systematic effect. Yes? But it, it could be, I mean, when you are comparing with data, you always uh, look at all games of uh, over, over, over the 10-year period. So it's not a really long period. But it could be that uh, if each individual game is not really like random walls, and then uh, since we are summing together uh, many, many games, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, I guess what I would say is once I have like a 100-step random walk, how can I tell you that this 100-step random walk is a random walk or some correlated process or a levy process? I mean, yeah, you, I mean, you, don't, you just don't have enough data in a single game to say one trajectory is random walk-like or not. So I, I have to do some averaging. Random walk is a probability measure, so you have to have average over several yes. instances because the random walk is many the yeah, yeah, that's one, of, that's one of the members of the yeah, ensemble. Yes, exactly yeah, so. Yeah, but you know, again, you, just with a single instance, you can't say anything. Okay, we have not l looked at that. that that's, that's a worthwhile point. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I think that this is actually a very important lesson because, you know, this is also like evolution. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly we see it in baseball. And I, you know, I, I mean, again, I see it like in academics, like in the American academic system, because like 40 years ago, well, if you didn't get a grant this time around, you know, it, it was all right. Maybe that's not going to kill your tenure. But you don't get the right grant at the right time at the assistant professor level. You know, kiss tenure goodbye. So there's just, you've got to have the right recommendation letters, the right, you know, NSF career award at the right time. So it's, I, it's, I think that there's so many things in life which, you know, again, people are in any competitive situation. You, it's never stay static. It's always getting m more competitive, and but you're running harder and harder to stay in place. That's that's what I think. Right. Right. The slope of that is something which seems to be like you know quite intuitive to humans, I guess, and the highly trained humans in that in that kind. Is it possible to even compare between you know, I don't know basketball and? That's a really that's a really so good question. Because you know, for example, you know, 
Yeah. No, no, that's a really good question, and I don't, um, I don't know what else to compare it against, though, because yeah, again, we only have ten years of data. I don't know. We don't know more than that. That's right. Yeah, but I mean, the other thing is that um, you know, it's also in basketball where you can get like a forty-point lead. Like in other games, like you don't get such huge <laughs> leads. So, yeah, if there's a sport where you could actually have that range, it'd be interesting to see what happens. No, I never spoke with Bill James. So the, the community never looked well, I'll, I'll tell you, actually, when I gave a public lecture on a similar subject in Santa Fe about two years ago, and the local newspaper interviewed me, and they did a really great assassination job because they didn't tell me they were also speaking to the coach of the University of New Mexico basketball team. So I gave them my spiel, you know, that it's a random walk, there's no correlation. And then comes the next paragraph, the, um, the coach of the U UNM basketball team. Redner is wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I feel it when I, I'm a coach. I've been coaching all my life. I feel it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so. so. What? Exactly. Yeah. So again, I go back to that quote in the paper by Gilovich and company that, you know, common experience is a very bad indicator of statistical patterns. <laughs>